Please turn in your Bible to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and this morning we consider verse 12 and also verses 14 and 15. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, we are learning about prayer. This prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, is a prayer for Christians, it is a prayer for those who can come into the presence of God and call him our Father in heaven. And he is our Father through faith in the Lord Jesus. It is a prayer which focuses upon God and his glory. God's name, God's kingdom, God's will in this world. But it is also a prayer which then goes on to consider our personal needs. And it speaks about the needs of the whole person, physical and spiritual. We have one petition for the body, give us this day our daily bread, and two petitions for our spiritual needs. Forgive us our debts, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Notice the priority here. We have much more relating to the spirit than we have to the body. And there is here an implicit rebuke to our materialism. There is an implicit rebuke to those who concentrate almost wholly upon the body and the things of this present life, who treat man as though he was a mere animal and nothing more. The Bible makes clear that our spiritual well-being is far more important than even our bodily well-being. And there are many who live in great prosperity and are doing very well for themselves physically, but who are spiritually bankrupt. Our Lord tells at least two parables about this. The parable of the rich fool who has his bumper harvest and he has it made for life and he's congratulating himself. You've got it um, laid up for many years to come, eat, drink, be merry. And the Lord rebukes him with the words, this night your soul is required of you. Then where shall these things be? There's also the story of the rich man and Lazarus the man who is rich and he feeds sumptuously every day. He dines well. He's clothed in purple and fine linen. He has everything he needs for the physical body. And there at his gate, there is laid this poor, pathetic creature, Lazarus, who is ill and full of sores and has really got nothing. And yet when they die... We find the rich man in hell. We find the rich man in torment while Lazarus is in a place of happiness in the bosom of Abraham. And our Lord is pointing again to us that the body has its importance, there is no doubt about that, but the spirit is much more important. And we are not to live by bread alone. We are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth 
of God. And so we are taught to value the spiritual more than the material. Yes, we are to give thanks for our daily bread. We are to pray for our daily bread. But we are to value much more the spiritual nourishment of God's word. Is there someone here who takes great care of your physical body and yet you neglect your immortal soul? You take care for this life which can only last a few years at the very most and you neglect eternity which lasts forever. We are reminded by the emphasis, the priorities of this prayer, not to be like the rich fool, not to be like the rich man, but to have a proper concern for our spiritual well-being. Well, we come then to look at this petition, forgive us our debts. In looking at this, I'm going to do so by means of six questions. The first of which is this, what does our Lord mean by debts? Forgive us our debts. Obviously a debt is what we owe to someone. And we owe to God our total love and obedience and every sin is failure to pay to God what we owe him and therefore every sin can be considered as a debt. By using the word debt our Lord seems to emphasize the idea of our failures, our failure to do what God requires our failure to fulfill the obligations that God has laid upon us. The two great obligations that God has laid upon us are to love him with all our heart and soul and mind, our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And every failure to love God with all our heart and soul is a debt that we owe to God. And every failure to love our neighbor as ourself is a debt that we now owe to God. Every breach of God's commandments is a debt. And these debts may consist, or they may take various forms, they may, of course, take the form of outward deeds. Things which we have done that have actually, in an outward way, been contrary to the commandments of God. God says, you shall not steal. But maybe you have stolen. You have outwardly broken the commandment of God. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But maybe you have treated the Lord's day with contempt. You've treated it just the same as any other day. That is an outward breach of the commandments of God. And so with all the commandments. But we must understand that our debts are not limited to these open, outward transgressions of the law. God's law reaches to our inward dispositions. Behold, you desire truth in the inward part, we read in Psalm 51. And we fail in the thoughts and the imaginations of our hearts. And our debts are not to be added up only by looking at our outward transgressions, but also every failure of heart, 
every failure in our thinking, every failure in our emotional life to love what is good and to hate what is evil is a debt. And of course, when we express our inward thoughts by words, the words, when they are contrary to God and his truth, his holiness, these are sins, they are debts. And not only, not only the outward deeds and words and the inward dispositions, but we must understand that we incur debt just as much by our failure to do what God requires as by doing what God forbids. And so we have sins of commission, where we have in a positive way transgressed God's law, and we have sins of omission, where we have simply neglected to do what was our duty. We have been like the priest and like the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember this poor man had been beaten up and was lying half dead and dying by the wayside and the priest came by and the Levite came by and what did each of them do? They passed by on the other side. Their consciences told them what they ought to do. Nevertheless, they passed by on the other side. And how often have you and I done exactly the same? God has put us in a position where it has been clear to us what is our responsibility to do, what God requires of us. And we have passed by on the other side. We have turned away, we have neglected what is our Christian duty. And so we must understand that every failure, every failure to do the will of God is a sin and it is reckoned to us as a debt which we owe to God. And when we consider that, and when we consider our own lives, must we not confess that we are all of us each and every one guilty of innumerable failures in relation to God, innumerable failures in relation to one another. We have all in the spiritual realm accumulated a vast unpayable debt and there is not one of us who does not have abundant reason to pray, forgive us our debts. That is what our Lord means by a debt. Does the Christian, this is the second question, does the Christian need to ask forgiveness? And the answer to that is yes, because sin is not forgiven, or to use the analogy here of our Lord, debt is not cancelled until we repent and confess it. First of all, we must be clear about this, that Christ has not brought indiscriminate forgiveness to everybody. Now, there are many people, of course, who think that he has. There are many people who think that just by being human, we have been forgiven. Because Christ came into the world to save men and women. And so, he has saved everybody. Everybody is on the way to heaven. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that that is simply not true. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Yes, indeed, but he does not save all sinners. 
He does not save unrepentant sinners, sinners who continue in defiance of God and his law, sinners who hear the gospel and yet decide to ignore it, to set light by it. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus saves sinners who repent and who believe in him. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Right at the very end of his sermon on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the crowd heard that, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, <clears throat> and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And notice that Peter makes it very clear that there is something that these people must do in order to have forgiveness. They must repent. They must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Because forgiveness is found in Christ and in him alone. And forgiveness is given to those who repent and turn to God through him and to them alone. When the angel appeared to Mary and uh, told her that she would bring forth a son, the angel said to her, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And in order to be forgiven, we must be numbered among the people of God. We must be united by faith to Jesus Christ. We must come to God through him in repentance. And you see, there is this unmistakable biblical message. Those who believe in Jesus Christ receive the forgiveness of sins. Those who do not believe, those who do not come to God by him, remain in their sins. Their debt remains. In John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, we read, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so that's the first thing that we must be clear about, that we need to ask forgiveness because forgiveness is not indiscriminate and universal and automatic. We must seek it through Jesus Christ. But then secondly, we must understand that Christians need constantly to seek forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I have heard this said. When we become Christians, God forgives all our sins, past, present and future. At the least, that is a highly misleading statement. When we believe in the Lord Jesus, our sins are indeed forgiven. There is no question about that. All past sin is forgiven. We are justified through faith in the Lord Jesus. To be justified 
is the opposite of to be condemned. We pass from a state of condemnation to a state of forgiveness, acceptance, reconciliation with God. And our justification, our right standing with God, is not dependent upon what we are in ourselves. It's not based upon our holiness. It is simply because when we believe in the Lord Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is reckoned to us. Our debt is paid in full by him. God reckons the righteousness of Jesus to our account and we can never again come under condemnation. But we must understand that this change of legal status, the change from condemnation to justification, is not the only change which takes place. At the same time, we are adopted into God's family. We become sons and daughters of God. We have a new relationship with God as our Father. Before we were strangers, we were foreigners, now we belong to the family of God. So what happens when a Christian sins. As regards justification, as regards our standing in the sight of God, nothing happens. The Christian is not brought under condemnation again when he commits sin. He is not in danger of being cast into hell. He is still a man or a woman in Christ and he still has this righteous status before God. But as regards the family relationship, something certainly happens. There is a marring of fellowship with our Father in heaven. Indeed, there is even a marring of fellowship with our Christian brothers and sisters. We cannot come again into condemnation, but we certainly can and do come under God's fatherly displeasure. And I think this is easily illustrated from our own experience of family relationships. Suppose that someone breaks into your house and steals money. What do you do? You go to the police and you give evidence against the guy if they can catch him and he is brought before the courts of the law and he is tried and condemned and punished. Supposing that your katulong steals money from you. Well, whether you drag her before the courts is up to you, but certainly you're probably going to dismiss her from your household. You're not going to have in your household someone who is stealing your money. Supposing that it is your son or your daughter who steals from you. Do you call the police? Do you have them taken to court? Do you give evidence against them to have them put into prison? Do you throw your son or your daughter out of your house and utterly disown them and tell them that I am no longer your father, I am no longer your mother, from now on you're on your own? Not if you are a good father or a good mother, you don't. You deal with this matter it's not that it doesn't matter, it's not that you don't care, you will be angry, but your anger will be the anger of a father with his child. And that's a very different matter from the condemnation of the law against a criminal. 
And you see, when the Christian is united by faith to Jesus Christ, he becomes a son of God. He enters into this new relationship. He is adopted into God's family. And God is not going to cancel that decree of adoption every time that you and I commit sin. It does not mean that God doesn't care. He certainly can be angry with his children. Hebrews 12 deals at length with this whole matter of the business of chastening. God chastening his children, just as a father chastens his children when they go astray. God can be angry with his children. I sometimes hear something to the effect that if you are a Christian, God is always pleased with you. I do not believe that. You may be a Christian and your heavenly father may be angry with you. You may incur his displeasure. You may incur his chastening rod. There may be certain things that happen to you in your life which are precisely because your father is angry. And your father, who still loves you, wants to bring you back to repentance and to be the kind of Christian that he wants you to be. And so, you see, God does care about the sins of Christians. Even though they do not bring us under condemnation, even though they do not take you to hell, yet God cares and God requires that we must repent and ask for forgiveness, even as Christian believers. Just as you, if you have children, you will insist that they say sorry. They apologize to you when they do wrong. Question three. What are God's requirements for forgiveness? Principally, the answer is repentance. Repentance is always in Scripture connected with forgiveness. At the end of the Gospel of Luke, we read this, Then Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Notice the way that our Lord links together there that repentance and forgiveness be preached to all the nations. The two are inseparable. Not only repentance, not only forgiveness, but that we should preach repentance and forgiveness. Repentance leading to the forgiveness of sins. The apostles understood this clearly. Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And repentance is always connected closely to forgiveness. Now, this is true even when our Lord speaks about our responsibility to forgive one another. Listen to his words in Luke 17, 3. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent you shall forgive him. Notice that our Lord does not require us to forgive the unrepentant person who has sinned against us, though he certainly does require us to have a a longing and a desire to forgive when that person does repent. And God himself does not forgive the unrepentant. What is involved in repentance? First of all, 
Repentance involves acknowledgement of guilt. The confession, I have sinned. I have done wrong. As long as we deny that we have done wrong, as long as we excuse it, well, yes, it was wrong in a sense, but you see there were all manner of things that compelled me to do it, and we are making excuses, it wasn't really my fault. That is not repentance. Repentance involves coming to this point where we see clearly and we acknowledge before God, I have sinned. I have done wrong. Secondly, repentance involves the realization that there is mercy for us with God. The psalmist says, there is forgiveness with you. Without this realization, it is impossible to turn to God. The Apostle Paul says, do you not know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? No one can repent. No one can go to God who expects nothing but hell and damnation and judgment. We cannot repent unless we believe that there is forgiveness with God. And that is a tremendous truth, that God forgives sin. We must believe that. We must believe that God is gracious and full of compassion and ready to forgive. And then thirdly, repentance involves turning to God. In the pigsty, the prodigal son came to his senses and he said, I will arise and I will go to my father. In other words, the man who until now had been running away from his father, he had got as far away as he possibly could, now he says, I will go back. I will arise and I will return to my father. That is the very opposite, you see, of Adam, who after he had sinned and became aware that, as it were, God was looking for him, Adam and his wife, they fled and they hid themselves away from the presence of God. They could not, of course, accomplish that, but they tried. Had they been repentant, they would have come to God with confession. We must come to God, the God from whom perhaps we have been running away. If someone here is not a Christian, maybe you have been running away from God all your life. Maybe for many years you have been running away from God. Now you must come to him if you are to receive the forgiveness of sins. And maybe even as a Christian, even as a Christian, you may be running away from God. I knew a remarkable case of a girl in the United Kingdom who um, committed a particular sin and she wasn't prepared to um, face up to it and she decided she wanted to get right away from God and her Christian friends and from uh, everything uh, Christian at all. And she, she actually got herself a job, I think it was in Alaska or in the north of Canada, someplace about as far as she could possibly go. And she went to get away from God. And <clears throat> when she arrived at her destination, an old lady met her. And among the first words, of the old lady to her were these. She said, are you a Christian, my dear? And she had to confess that she was, but she was running away from God. Jonah did the same, didn't he? 
he was running away from God. And maybe, maybe there is someone here, and although you are a Christian, and although you are physically here in this meeting with other Christians, you are physically present in the, the congregation of the Lord's people and in this worship service, yet maybe in your heart you are still running away from God and you are not prepared to return to him. God's word requires you, God requires you to come back to him. There is forgiveness for those who repent, who acknowledge their guilt, who realize that there is mercy with God and who come to God with confession. And that's the fourth thing that repentance involves. It involves confession. We sang together in Psalm 32, I will now read to you in the, the prose version of that psalm, verses 3 to 5, where the psalmist describes his experience when he was refusing to confess his sin. He says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. He was refusing to confess. He was <coughs> avoiding God. Then he says, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And of course, the great classic example of confession is the psalm that we read as our first reading, Psalm 51. Perhaps you would turn for a moment to Psalm 51, this confession of sin. The title tells us that it was a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him. Nathan brought to him the convicting word of God. Nathan confronted him with the evil of his sin. And David responded, and this psalm is his confession of sin. In verses 1 and 2, he expresses what is his desire. He desires mercy, cleansing from sin. Not forgiveness alone, but the complete removal of sin. Wash me thoroughly. Wash me through and through from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And he acknowledges that this cleansing, this forgiveness can only come through the mercy, the loving kindness of God. In verses 3 and 4, we have his acknowledgement of guilt. Against you, you only, I have sinned. That is a fundamental part of confession, that we plainly acknowledge we have sinned against God. In verse 5, he acknowledges that this is not just some completely isolated lapse. On the contrary, it is true to his sinful nature with which he was born. He has been a sinner all his life. And he acknowledges that we are not talking here about outward things alone. God desires truth in the inward parts. And then in verses 7 to 11, he pours out his prayer to God. And the earnestness of it is very evident in the language. He says, purge me, wash me, heal my broken bones, hide your face, blot out my transgressions, create a clean heart within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. And it is clear in these 
verses that we have no prayer of mere words. He is not simply going through some kind of formality. He does not simply say, well, I have sinned, so I will pick up a prayer book and I'll find an appropriate prayer that I can just recite and make a, a formal confession. Here he is pouring out his heart to God in this earnest agony that God would cleanse and renew him. In verses 12 to 15, he speaks of the hope of the, the hoped for consequences of forgiveness. He says, When you forgive me, I will teach others your ways. I will sing aloud of your righteousness. I will show forth your praise. He's not bargaining with God as if he um, was saying, if you forgive me, then I will in turn do this, that and the other. Like Luther, um, when he was in the thunderstorm and terrified for his life and he prayed to Saint Anne, Saint Anne, help me and I will become a monk. He was bargaining, not with God, but actually with Saint Anne for some reason. But that's not what the psalmist is doing. He's not saying, okay, here are the terms, you do this and then I'll do that. He is simply expressing that if only God will forgive me, then gladly and willingly and joyfully I will speak of him to others. I will praise his gracious name. Verses 16 and 17, he emphasizes that he brings no outward formal sacrifice. Rather, he brings a broken heart, knowing that God will not despise that. Brothers and sisters, I believe that each one of us should be well acquainted with this psalm. It is a psalm, a pattern, a model of confession of sins. And we ought to seek not only to use its words, its phrases, but we ought to seek to imbibe its spirit, to experience something of what the psalmist experienced in coming before God. Our fourth question is on what grounds, what formal grounds does God forgive? There is only one ground of forgiveness and that is that God's own son died to pay our debt. In his life he fulfilled all righteousness. In his death, he laid down that sinless life for us. He bore our sins. He paid our debt. And we must be clear that the one and only basis upon which God can righteously and justly forgive sin is that our debt has been paid by God. Jesus Christ. There is nothing left for you or for me to pay. There is nothing else that can form any part of the basis of forgiveness. God does not forgive us on the grounds that we are sorry, on the grounds that we are determined not to do it again. These would be altogether inadequate and worthless grounds for forgiveness. God forgives on the ground that the debt has been paid by Jesus Christ. Your sorrow cannot pay the debt you owe to God. Your good resolutions for the future cannot pay the debt you owe to God. Christ and Christ alone has paid your debt and it is the only ground of forgiveness. When we come to God and we pray, forgive us our debts, we are asking that he will forgive them because our Saviour died and lives for us. Question five, how does God forgive? 
First, he forgives freely. He forgives because it is in his gracious character to forgive. Listen to what we read of God's appearing to Moses. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He is revealing himself as the God in whose nature it is to show compassion and mercy. Again, through Ezekiel, he says to the disobedient people of Israel, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? It is an earnest appeal of God to men and women who are going on in their sins, heading for eternal judgment. And God says, why will you die? Turn, I have no pleasure in your death, but rather that you turn to me and live. And God forgives freely. It pleases God to forgive sin through Jesus Christ. We must be clear about that. Christ came into the world to save sinners. It is the purpose for which he came. And it pleases God to forgive sin through him. He forgives freely. He forgives completely. He forgives great sins as well as small. He forgives glaring sins. He forgives secret sins. The Apostle Paul describes himself as the chief of sinners, and yet his sins were forgiven. In Psalm 25, the psalmist prays, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, because it is great. He does not say, forgive my sin, Lord, it's only a little one, just overlook it. He says, for your name's sake, because it is in your nature to be compassionate, to show mercy. Show mercy to me for my great sin and glorify your name. Does not Jesus speak about an unforgivable sin? He does. And yet we must be clear about this that when Jesus speaks of the sin that is unforgivable, he is speaking about sin that is unforgivable because of the irremediable hardness of the person's heart, which refuses to acknowledge the truth and refuses to seek forgiveness. And so if there should be anyone here and the devil is troubling you with this tormenting question, but haven't you sinned beyond forgiveness? The answer is no, you have not. Because if you had committed the unforgivable sin, you would not be troubled about it in the least. You would be in a state of indifference and total hardness and rejection. It would not be something that worried you. And if there should be someone here and you are worried, you are anxious, you've been reading the Bible, you've read about the sin which never has forgiveness, and you, you're concerned, maybe I've committed that sin. I say to you this morning, no, you haven't. Or you would not be troubled about it. Your very anxiety is absolute proof that you have not sinned unforgivably. There is forgiveness for all your sins in Jesus Christ. Finally, what are the effects of God's forgiveness? 
If we turn back for a moment to Psalm 51, towards the end of the psalm, verse 14, he says, Deliver me from guilt, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Open my lips, my mouth shall show forth your praise. The first thing is praise and thanksgiving to God. The effect of knowing in your heart that God has forgiven your sin must inevitably be a spirit of thankfulness to God. He also mentions in verse 13 a desire for the salvation of others. Then he says, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Charles Wesley captures the same sentiment here in one of his hymns. He says, Oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of his grace. The arms of love that compass me would all mankind embrace. He is writing as a man conscious of the love of God for him. And the effect upon him is to say, Oh, that the whole world might experience the forgiveness the grace that God has given to me. But notice that this desire that others might be forgiven must inevitably involve the desire to forgive those who have sinned against us. We cannot say, oh, that sinners might be forgiven, but I'm not going to forgive that person who sinned against me last week. Can we? You see, that is just impossible. If we really believe that we have sinned grievously against God, and if we believe that God in his mercy has forgiven us through Jesus Christ, then our spirit, our attitude towards that other person who committed that incredibly trivial sin by comparison against us must be changed. And we must take seriously the words of Jesus. Verse 14 and 15 of Matthew 6, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Those who cannot or will not forgive others cannot know the forgiveness of God. God will not forgive those who cannot or will not forgive others. Now, you see, this is not a kind of condition as though if we forgive, then we will deserve to be forgiven. Perish that thought. Rather, it's simply saying this, that if you have truly been convicted of your own guilt, and if you have been forgiven by the grace of God, it is inevitable, it is inevitable that you must be made willing to forgive others. And if you have not been made willing to forgive, then that is the clearest evidence that you yourself have not been forgiven. How are you to forgive others? Freely and completely, because that is how God forgives us. Well then, in conclusion, let us be thankful to God. There is forgiveness with God. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. However great, however glaring, however terrible your sins may be, God says, come, come through Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him. 
Call upon me through the Lord Jesus, and forgiveness will be yours. May God grant that each one of us here may know the reality of the forgiveness of sins. Amen.